This will call the meeting. Uh, we're going to start with the pledge. simply start by saying, I can go back, you know, in the town of Acton, when you had an elected treasurer in elected positions, and when you went back and you had paper and pen, you know, that you were keeping track with your books, you know, 14, 15 years ago. I remember those days well, you know, and I remember when you were using QuickBooks software, and what I am sure of, you know, is the town of Acton has evolved and certainly stepped into many best practices that certainly came certainly came with, with prices and you know and struggles, you know, but certainly I think that you're there now and uh, and yeah, I just think it's great here that we're sitting here talking about some questions and I can be me and offer you any sounding board that you need tonight. All right, ready to get started? Fire. Question number one, what is your general assessment of the integrity and competence of the organization's financial accounting, computer, and internal audit staff or management? Well, it's a good one to start. You evolved a lot from paper and pencil and QuickBooks for sure, you know, and went into the Trio software now. So I think the software is certainly one of the more popular softwares out there in the governmental world for, uh, for accounting software packages. So I think that that is uh, good software. I think that the software has suffered a lot in the past two years by migrating to a new platform and pretty much outsourcing out of Bangor, which is where they were birthed, and to Canada now. But, uh, but I, you've got a good software. And as far as your staff and, and uh, the management of the town, I think that your staff are very capable. I think that they understand their business. They have a lot of knowledge and certainly were able to, uh, uh, to come in, assess. You know, and quickly, you know, advise and make recommendations and have conversations that are understood by your people. So, when Karen was here and it was her first year, and she may be able to expand a little bit on that based upon her and her experiences with other clients, you know, and a first year experience with acting. Anything you want to expect in the mind? Um, obviously, um, the staff is what you know, the staff was um, very helpful in, in the audit. There were um, very few journal entries and things that we had to do. So that confidence level and the understanding of, of the town and how it works was, was definitely there. There were no major problems. Okay. Question two, were there any unresolved questions from the prior year's audit? Uh, there was nothing. We would have to dispose of any of those comments. There was nothing to do. Number three, how did the plan scope of your audit differ from prior year, uh, from no, the prior year? No different. You know, so any, when you go in and audit government, specifically a municipality, we have programs and checklists that are designed and geared specifically for who you are and what you do, you know, and those programs and checklists don't change. You know, if you add certain things, and 
can give you an example if there was a TIF district in the town or you birthed you know, a wind power project in your backyard and you know, went through things like that, there'd be programs that, uh, you know, that are developed around that and any type of new business that you add to your municipality, but the, 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 the scope and the planning is all the same from year to year. It's very structured. Um, I believe three and four are duplicate, so. Number five, since this was your first year here, were there any questions regarding accounting, auditing, or reporting matters between you and management? If so, how were they resolved? Well, I'm sure that's probably geared towards care. And, uh, and here's what I'm also sure of. There were a couple of issues that we talked about with uh, um, the private road matter and with your ambulance receivables and the handling of all that and probably other many conversations that had all that care and you know, speak to those. So those were, those were two of the, um, the issues that we had conversation about in the resolution. Resolution to... Uh, we all ask the same questions. We have an, uh, an entrance interview where I sat down with John and Michelle and uh, uh, went through their cash receiving process, their disbursement process, and this, but um, all of their internal controls. So, our first year auditor here, or if, if it was Bruce who had done the audit, the, the questions are generally the same and then more questions get generated based on the answers that they give. Number six, did you anticipate any special problems in this year's audit based on last year's audit? We always expect the unexpected, so yeah, I think there's always an anticipation, you know, and, and again, the two talking points with the, um, you know, the uh, private roads and the uh, uh, tax matter, the, the write-off, you know, that kind of caught billing. people off guard, that billing, ambulance billing, you know, th those were part of a checklist, you know, and a question that got generated that you know, it wasn't an issue in 2018, so it's not like it, uh, you know, um, uh, was a recurring problem. It was something very unique and specific to 2019. Number seven, how does the town of Acton's employee benefit package compare to other towns and cities in Maine? So, so, so when, when Karen and I read seven, eight, and nine, I mean, we're more than happy to use as a sounding board, but we're, we're auditors, you know, we're not, we're not payroll analysts, you know, we will look for unreasonable compensation for employees, but, you know, I know MMA that you're a member of puts out a salary survey that's available to you all, has a compensation package for various positions within your town based on population and things like that. So you can see what's available out to you and if you, you have a problem uh, getting that we'd be more than happy to get it for you but uh, I think that those are so seven eight and nine with like buyouts and preference and you know executive compensation as far as IRS those aren't those, those are nowhere in the scope of our audit programs you know for sure what we do look at is unreasonable compensation you know and there is nothing that rose to the level of unreasonable compensation here in Acton so am I continuing with eight and nine? No, I'll go right to ten. He's pretty much you pretty much answered. Yeah, seven, eight, and nine. I, I, like I say, and if you need any help getting a hands on that salary survey and other benefit packages, you know, if I, and if you want us to go in and want us to pull some of our clients, we'd want to get their permission, you know. But uh, we'd be more than happy to do that and uh, certainly offer that as a comparison for for, for, for people of act and size, you know, and what you do. Okay. Yeah. Number 10, who reviews and approves executives and board members' travel and other expenses, and have any questionable items been noted? A good indicator of appropriateness of such expenses is whether or not you'd be comfortable discussing them with an investigative reporter from your local newspaper or TV station, or with the taxpayers in a public forum. Well, I'm more than happy to discuss it in a public forum, for sure. You know, I don't want to have any independent conversations. I think that just leads to bad things, you know, so, uh, but as far as a conversation, we'll have a conversation any time and just to let you know what we do and how we do those you know and Karen's here she can speak to whether or not there are any problems uh, as part of our test work that certainly we would include in our sample size travel expenses and have things that come up to um, uh, the level of asking a question about why would a selectman put through travel and basically not have any documentation on what they did and whether or not it was identified for town business or not um, that's part of our sampling and testing that we do is you know with a general purpose scope of the audit and I don't believe anything came to our attention this year. 
Is the use of the town attorney excessive considering the town belongs to MMA where they have a legal department at our disposal at no extra cost? Well, there's a, there's a lot of people that belong to MMA that I sp see spending thousands of dollars on attorneys for sure. Who, who is the town attorney? We use oh, Burke and Clegg for general and yeah, then right. we use Lankowski for land use. Yeah. So, so a couple of things. I think that's a matter of preference, you know, and if you're budgeting in it, it's part of your budget, you know, that your expectation is, is, is that you're more confident in somebody that specializes in that, you know, as opposed to being confined. And then this is with all due respect to MMA and their legal counsel, you know, a lot of people like to go to a specialized attorney, you know, who deals with litigation, who deals with tax abatements, who deals, you know, with that, you know, and they feel for whatever reason, their choice is that there's a better selection out there using a private firm, you know, as opposed to using the general counsel of MMA. But a lot of people use MMA too for certain selected questions that wouldn't rise to the level of, you know, uh, a specialized niche. Uh, uh, TIFs. I wouldn't go to MMA and use TIFs. I wouldn't at all. You know, I'd go to a general counsel, a firm that specializes in TIF, knows how to write them. Do you want to tell them what that is? Tax <laughs> incremental financing different, uh, district. You know, it's basically designating a section of the town of Acton or government, you know, for, for a special purpose. An industrial park is the first one that comes to my mind. Poland Spring is a TIF, you know, in the town of Poland. You know, and you go through special rights and it's approved by the main revenue services and Department of Economic and Community Development and it has great shelter, you know, uh, valuation benefits to it. You know, so that's a TIF. You know, it's some municipality, usually with the um, uh, enticement of trying to bring in commercial growth into its municipality to diversify its tax, tax base. That's something you want to use to specialize. Only probably three firms in the state, you know, that deal with that. You know, and these are the firms that actually write those, uh, that, that write the regulations. And MMA is is not, their, their legal department isn't um, a legal department for your primary legal. I mean, they could never cover every town in the state and give you for, for what you pay for dues. It's mostly for general for general questions that you have and they and if you have something specific they make you put it in writing so that they don't give you the wrong advice. So they're not designed to be your general counsel. Number 12, are there financial statements for the town charity Neighbors Helping Neighbors? Are proper cash controls in place? I think that was a special revenue of the town, correct? Yes. So I don't believe that there's financial statements per se that you would find for the town of Acton, but I am sure that it's a column on your financial statements that we would subject to normal auditing procedures. So, but it's immaterial. So I would say that, uh, um, you know, it's, it would be a column that exists within your financial statements. Immaterial is something that, you know, we use as a, science in our profession to say if there's a mistake would it impact the reader's decision on the financial statements this wouldn't you know so uh, as far as neighbors helping neighbors that's a fund you know within the town of Acton's financial statements and I did go through neighbors helping neighbors so that I could understand um, what the program was designed for and we went through all of the cash transactions and all of the expenses can the selectmen disregard their policies when they approve spending on a case-by-case -case basis? So, um, I'm not sure what that means, but here's what I'm sure of. Statute trumps ordinance, you know, statute trumps, you know, uh, uh, selectmen's, any personal decisions. So, there's a hierarchy, you know, that exists out there. So, if there's a law for statute, and there clearly is, that defines, you know, the process to pay a bill, you know, the, the, the responsibility of that selectman, you know, no, you can't, uh, you can't trump that, nor do we see any instances, you know, that I know that there were some matters of conversation, there was actually some decisions made, one with the ambulance, that weren't brought, weren't even brought to the Board of Selectmen to write those receivables off, that's a problem, you know, but as far as a case-by-case -case basis and your policies, you know, if you've adopted, you know, certain Robert's rules to orders or certain other, you know, um, uh, matters, you know, that uh, that apply to how you want to pay your bill, to be more expansive and complement the statute, you know, that's perfectly fine. You know, what I would say though is you got to live, live within those parameters for sure. So. Line item budgeting. Can monies associated with one line item be used for another purpose? What is and is not permissible? 
Uh, so that's a good question. So a couple of things. You know, I think as I recall in the town of Acton, that you're approving warrant articles specifically for departments, roads, things like that. And I think your roads budget's broken down into three or four pieces, as I recall. Mm -hmm. So those articles, if they are approved in totality, you know, by that department, that's what you're voting on. That's the constraints that you have to live in. You know, and what furthermore is, is I'm sure that you hold a public hearing just like any other municipality does, you know, for their budget, you know, as you adopt it and approve it. And probably you have conversations with your department heads, you know, as far as what's making up that budget and, and basically a spending plan, you know, that they're having for that year. I'm sure that that's presented to you in a line item. But how it's presented to the public, you know, is in totality of that warrant article. And I would say that's the constraint you have to live in. But if you're going to have best practice and you're going to put a budget in place and you're going to hold your department heads, excuse me, I would hold your department heads to the line items that they're proposing in their budget. And if for some reason that, you know, salaries is overspent, you know, but uh, supplies isn't, you know, uh, provided you're in, in totality, oh, you're okay, fine. But if I'm on, if I'm sitting in one of your chairs as a board of selectmen, I'd want to know why. You know, why within that line item, why within that department, you know, is there a uh, distortion, you know, between, forget about totality, you told us you were going to spend X on this line item. You spent Y. Why? So. What is your recommendation regarding the use of purchase orders? Why do you think they are or are not a good idea for the town? I'm not a big fan of purchase orders. I'll be perfectly honest. I'll make it crystal clear. You know, purchase orders, when, when you see a lot that we see in the world, when the invoice or the payment actually beats or arrives before the purchase orders, purchase orders are nothing more than like an accounts payable cover sheet that says go ahead and pay this bill. And so so a purchase order is a big system. A purchase, if used right, a purchase order is a software uh, generated, you know, creature, you know, that you need the software to do. A purchase order takes time. And if you're going to use a purchase ordering system, which we don't discourage, but use it in the right way and the right intent. And I just think it's going to create more time. I think it's going to create more energy, more staff time, more software needs that you're going to have. And I think that there would be some big adjustments. And with the size of the fiscal staff here in Acton, I just don't think that that's, that's a route road that we would send you down right now. I, I want to know why, you know, why, you know, what's causing and what's rising to the level of that it thinks that you need, you know, that purchase order system. So I want to know that before, you know, certainly we give you any more advice, but I'm not a big fan of purchase orders. There's just a lot of big time commitments and people don't use them, you know, in their intended use. And that's a problem. So. I think you answered this one, but um, 16, if town meeting approved a lump sum budget, should the selectman make the department follow a line item budget worksheet? So the answer is yes, absolutely. That's what they, they put up. Legally, I would probably say it would stand the test of time. You don't have to, but but having your department heads, you know, putting a line item budget in there so that you can hold them to it. Yeah, I think that that's a great best practice, and I would absolutely say yes to that for sure. Number 17, is there sufficient separation of duties and roles, checks and balances? Uh, so I assume that that means fiscal staff. I mean, you're, you're, we've got three people. We have town office. We have fiscal. We have four. So three, one is one. Well, part time. we have three and one open right now. So, so we have four. So here's what I'm sure of. Um, uh, there is nothing that I would say or recommend that would create. Years ago, we did. You didn't have the staff level 10, 14, 15 years ago. We made recommendations to internally, you know, change what people did and I actually think it created a staffing position you know fiscally uh, for us to say you know that um, uh, you, you know that there's a cost benefit and going out and creating a part-time or full-time position by making sure that I's dotted or T's cost I don't think there's anything that's come to the level you know in the town of Acton you know that said you need this position now you know to make sure that your bank reconciliations you know are being done properly in accordance with best practices they are you've got fire 
all the primary areas with bank recs, tax receivable, you know, uh, 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 reconciliations, general ledger reconciliations. You've got firewalls in place with a staff, literally a staff of two and three, you know, that uh, quite frankly you didn't have years ago. And I, I think that this town, you know, looked in the mirror, took that very seriously, made a lot of internal changes, and you know, and I, I, I think that um, you know now to to add staffing, I would definitely want to make sure that the cost benefit would be there, and I just don't see anything, you know, that uh, would rise to the level where it would say, hey, you need to go get this position. No way. 18, <clears throat> did you find the internal controls are adequate in our municipality? In general, good internal controls involve segregation of duties. Given that our, current, our staff consists of two people at this time who may handle monetary transactions, who may or may not be working alone and are the only staff that can handle money, there are four other employees who do not have fiduciary privileges, how can we adequately segregate duties? So a couple things. I wouldn't say your staff consists of two people you know, in this process. You've got a board of selectmen of three, You've got the public. You've got many eyes, you know, on a process. So let me first say that. You may have two, three people in this office fully staffed that handle the fiscal operations, but there's many eyes on that. And there's no blueprint statutorily that says how many staff that you have to have to handle a TAF with a general uh, budget, general operating budget of $3.1 million. There's no blueprint for that. So do I think that you've got adequate staff and controls in place, you know, to, you know, to alleviate some of the concerns of us from the outside looking in? Absolutely. You know, I think you've got those firewalls in place. Do I think, you know, that we could go out of position to to double-double, you know, uh, make things better? Of course. Do I think that that's warranted? No, like I said before. You know, but clearly I think you've got practices in place. I think that you've got some 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 areas, you know, of, of, of concern, you know, that lie outside this building like your third-party building agency. You know, for one, there's a uh, there's a good one right there for an example that you had no control over. But obviously the process caught that matter and certainly raised it to the level of what can we do differently going forward. And it caught it pretty fast because it was within a year, you know, of that uh, of that happening. So something's working. Yep. Have the auditors made any recommendations for improvements and controls? What are they? Why weren't these problems discovered and fixed in the past? Well, the two problems I just talked about weren't problems of the past. You know, any pro I can tell you this, any problem of the past has been discussed brutally with the town of Acton in our relationship for sure. You know, and I can tell you the problems that came up this year were discussed, dealt with, and a corrective action plan was put in place. So uh, I'm unaware if you guys have any other concerns, you know, that have popped up since post audit, you know, for a lack of a better way to say it. But I know the two primary things that uh, that were uh, discussed and dealt with during this audit. Yeah, we're confident that they've been signed off and certainly I think more attention is being paid in those areas for sure. Do you believe our operating reserves are adequate? If not, what should we do about it? So, so a couple of things on that. So um, uh, do I think that they're adequate in totality? Yes. You know, I think Acton's got money. I think Acton is a financially stable. I'd probably give your financial grade a B plus. You know, for a B plus. I think that that's a fair grade. Why would I do that? You know, because I think that you have the the the, na the national benchmarks for the profession: 30, 60, and 90 days. You know, of your operating budget sitting in reserve. You've got that. You know, you've got that. You know, what I would probably do better of, and we talked about this you know before is you you what you will do in totality I think you had 2.1 million dollars of, of carryover balance coming into this fiscal year 2020 1.7 wasn't tied down to anything so so when you can when you can compare that in totality to your operating budget I think that's very healthy I think that puts you above average you know in uh, you know in financial terms you know for for government where I think that you could do a better job is is that you you have this you know this um, uh, process or this process I think that's a good word where you'll take your money and you'll say we're going to use so much for a revaluation re we're going to use so much for that road project or this road project or that road project 
since you have the money now, one thing that would probably be a good idea while you have the money is to take and set up a general capital reserve. Set up some kind of other, the school's done it. Look at the school's financial statements. They'll have special ed reserve, equipment reserve. I'd argue the town could have a, 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 a broad category of a capital reserve, a maintenance reserve. You know, that capital could cover buildings and grounds. That capital could cover roads. It could do it, but you usually do it project by project. The good news is you got the money, but, but do you have a plan? You know, and I don't really think that you can go one place and find that plan, you know, and, uh, and I know that this was a conversation years ago, you know, about that, but it just wasn't time. You know, there were just so many other things going on here that, that involved, you know, money and, and to raise the mill rate just wasn't an option, you know, back, you know, back then. But now it is. Now that you've got time, it is time to look in the mirror, I think. And, you know, and there probably are some plans out there, you know, that, uh, that would make sense for you. Capital being the first one that comes to my mind. And, uh, and make it yours. Yeah, make it yours. I think that that's one area for sure. Because that money, when we look at it, that's all you got. You know, it's one pool of money designed to take care of all of Acton's problems. So, whereas opposed to looking at a science, you know, we're like, well, we should have a capital plan. We're spending a lot of money on roads, but usually we're spending it as that project comes in and the road commissioner comes and says this or that or whatever it says. Well, good. How about you have another discretionary, you know, in your capital reserve? How about you have a road reserve, you know, where you've actually got access to that money. Your townspeople voted on that uh, reserve $50,000 this past year for your for your private roads. Looking at those types of situations and whether or not that was done to protect the watershed here in Acton or whatever the reasons are, you had a reason for it. And usually behind a reason is a plan. And what I'm saying is, is while you have this $1.7 million, should it reside in another column in the form of a plan, and capital plan is the biggest one that I really think that you could uh, uh, probably benefit from, for sure. When reimbursing for equipment use, should the town be paying the individual or the business that owns the equipment? How do you determine which is proper? Yeah, I, I would want to see the contract on that. And I think that's probably more of a legal question, but I'd opine, you know, on that. And, and just so I'm clear, I'm assuming this has got to be for your road commissioner? Correct. So the road commissioner, you have um, an, an agreement. So so the road commissioner is a statutory position. They're elected. Yeah, they're elected. And, and what I'm sure of is you probably have an agreement with this road commissioner, too as well as equipment and how that cost is paid in with the uh, town meeting uh, town meeting votes on the rates okay so you vote <laughs> I don't know what else you would need you know as far as that except to make sure that the rate you're voting on which I'm sure is on the, that's the town people but are you, you know, paying the on. individual the road commissioner or the individual's so company I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet okay. I'm still Sorry. trying to understand you know what it is that you're doing well I think what the question is here is well the way we run the road commissioners now I used to be a road commissioner so mm -hmm. I know this process pretty well yeah um, what we do is we elect our road commissioners and we pay our employees uh, as town employees okay mm -hmm. uh, they're using uh, including, the, including the road commissioner too correct road commissioner also um, and they also but they're using their own equipment so I think um, there was a little bit of a trying to figure out whether or not that would be Libel, you know, for us, libel, whether or not that's a good thing for us to be doing. And it's actually having these part-time employees, whether it be beneficial to go to a contractor position. Yeah, so, so a couple of things. Um, one, it's a statutory position. So whether or not you go to contract, you got to make the roads and act impassable. And what I'm hearing is... No, not contract, meaning a subcontractor. Meaning they yeah, meaning you're going to hire another employee. company to, to like plow your roads. Yeah, whoever... Pave them. The road... road the, you want to make the road commissioner as as a subcontractor? Not the road commissioner per se. The the people yeah, that he's hired using. out, I mean, and the got people it. plowing and stuff like that. Yeah, got it. But right now, That's you have an elected road commissioner, and okay. that elected road commissioner owns their own equipment. Correct. Right. And, and the question and, and, does whatever, and, and, yeah. and the question is 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 who's the check supposed to be made out right. to? Right. I would right. argue it's the person that owns the equipment. You know, not the company, is, not the business. But if he owns the company, I would argue what's the difference? You know, and if we get That's, into that was the question. You know, twelve to one to a half a dozen to another, then I would just consult your attorney. Yeah. You know, and find out if there needs to be any language. I, I believe that. That. That's what the question was referencing. Yeah. I believe. And then you probably ten ninety nine your road commissioner for uh, so I don't think that there's any you know uh, intent you know to not make it known that you're uh, 
leasing or using or having access to this equipment. And the way I look at it, and, and we just had a municipality that decided for, for reasons that I wouldn't have agreed with that, hey, you know, we're not going to do this anymore. We had, we, they, they went with their own local department that they had for public works and decided let's contract it out with somebody else because we're going to save a lot of money. Well, there wasn't a lot of money to be saved, you know, because in fact that person now, you know, uh, had his own equipment, etc. There was a cost of doing business now because of the equipment. There was the labor costs, etc. And I'm thinking you've already went out and spent a million dollars in equipment and now you're going to come up with the idea. That wasn't good planning. So, so if there's, and I guess where I'm going is, if there's talk about subcontracting or another way to do roads, I'd be more than happy to give you some information, you know, on that before you do it. So. 22. Is GASB 34 updated to 2018-2019? So GASB 34 came out about, oh my God, 15, it could be even 20 years ago. And basically they wanted uh, government's uh, financial statements to look like for-profit uh, financial statements, 10Ks in the public world. Um, so the answer is yeah, it's updated every year, you know, for infrastructure needs and, and, and what you own, what you buy, the depreciation, the wear and tear, and the town has all the schedules to support that every year. Are we better or worse off financially than we were a year ago? I think you're Why? Better, so better off, you know, for sure financially. I think your undesignated fund balance, it's $1.7 million now went up from last year. You've got a healthy school department, you know, and uh, why? Um, uh, your revenue collections were stronger than, than what you estimated when it came budget time. Um, and your expenses were underexpended in totality by two hundred thousand dollars. That's why what you, you acted all the things that need the perfect storm. Your monies came in higher than what you expected, and you spent less, you know, than what you budgeted for. Which were the reasons why your fund balance went up from eighteen to nineteen. And I believe your unassigned is one point seven million bucks. Are there any unresolved questions from this year's audit? Uh, no. So no, I know we talked about um, the collection policy and the write-off and all that. Are you good with how that was all disposed of? So we'd, we'd say no. I think the only thing we're, is pending is the Article 43, but we turned the billing over to collection. We did the check reconciliation. We did the copier thing with the fire department. I mean, the German. But there is a plan in place. With um, we're not accepting any new applications because we're still working on the plan. Yeah. So, again, over to so the we're not purdy what you're doing. Now. We just know it was talked about and that you guys were doing something. So that would be something. Just, everything just, down. Yeah, Shut it down. Down. I think we're that was a good move. move. I think it was a great move. Okay. Main state statute, Title 23, Chapter 305, Section 3105A, states town meeting may allow Board of Selectmen to use highway equipment on private way in the interest of fire and police protection. The town is currently plowing a private road in order to get to a town road. Statute says fire and police only. Is this proper? And if so, did town meeting approve this expenditure? So, a, a couple of things. Um, does that have anything to do with that? Okay. Mm -mm. So, uh, um, I, I don't even have an answer to that question right now. But here's what I understand: the question is, are you doing something that you're not supposed to be? You well, know, what, 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 like what it is is we have a we have a, a town road. I believe it's either one or there might be two in the whole state of Maine that has this issue. Mm -hmm. And the town road is actually at the end of a private road. Yep. The only way to get there is to go over the you private have road. Have to drive the private road to get there. So, um, back in the day, that private road was maintained by whoever the road association had, which was myself at the time. But over time, what ended up happening was um, back and forth, they changed their, their, their uh, decisions. But what ended up coming was we, the town of Acton went to town meeting to discontinue that road. Okay, so there would be no more maintenance on that private road because of that. Mm -hmm. Town of Acton said, no, we're going to keep it a town road. Our lawyers, oh, we've got the paperwork that said that no, we because we have interest in that road, that we have to maintain that to get those people in and out. Yeah. 
So that's where we've st stood with that. So, so to expand on that, knowing that, you've got to make those roads passable as a board of selectmen. Your road commissioner's charged with making those passable. We, we, do, we did it legally. Yep. The, the, the board back in, oh, I would say probably 12, maybe 11, 2011, 12. Yep. I, I, I'm not sure of the exact date. I remember getting the phone call. Um, but um, uh, we've been doing, they've been doing it since. So, so we do have legal documentation in the yeah. office. And I would say the statute's going to give you the ability to, because you've got to make that road passable. And if the only way you're able to do that is to get to there from this private road, you know, then, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the common sense tells me, you know, that the statute has given you that provision and that insulation to allow you to, to take care of that road. And your attorney obviously has, has found nothing that would contradict that. So... <laughs> Can you discuss your initial concerns with Article 43 and outline the direction given to the Board of Selectmen? New information has come to light pertaining to this article. See attached for statement by Maine DEP, which is legally reviewed. It appears the Road Committee was accurate in, the ter determination in their determination, Article 43, should follow the definition outlined in 3101 and repair and maintenance is permissible for reimbursement. Does the new information change your recommendations? It doesn't change my recommendation. Now, here's my recommendation. That's a wordy article that's for sure so and I think it's clear as mud when you reference three different statutes as I recall in that article you know so uh, but clearly I think that your attorneys have looked at it you know your people whether or not they understood it passed it you know so it's not like anything was being underhanded and when we reviewed that statute because that was a discussion point that we talked about and, and if my memory serves me that's the process right now you kind of put the brakes on you know too as well with your best practice you know is the best way I can say it so uh, so yeah I think that there's a better way to do it I think your article was really wordy you know but when it comes down to at the end of the day that there was a reason that this town thought it was in the best interest to, to do exactly what it was and put fifty thousand dollars you know way to do exactly that I think the question now becomes is who's policing the fifty thousand dollars is that being used what it's intended to in these applications you know where these people are applying you know for use or access to that money who's reviewing that and I know Karen had conversations with you code enforcement seems to be the logical person to be the enforcer you know of that so so I think that that's probably where the concern would lie you know I think there is as far as uh, we're, we're, we're it's a wordy stat it's a wordy article it we're, we're well, good that the what statute I, what I found with it was it was too much gray area yeah there There's, was nothing there was nothing yep. there stating exactly what we were yep. paying for and what we weren't yeah and, and, and the longer your article is the grayer it became you know as I read it you know but as far as the intent as far as known as far as bringing it to the public you know, clearly the wishes were is that there was favor in doing what exactly as you did. Now, parameters, best practice, who's going to police this thing? That's, I think, where your concern is that you've called time out now and looking at that. And I think that that was the, the letter of the letter of the law really is what we would have done and talked about. And that's what you've done. So good. In regards to Article 43, if a statutory road association that received money from the town is later found to be ineligible, is that association going to be responsible for paying the town the money back? Uh, that would be a legal question. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. If there is evidence that a road association took money from the town and they had prior knowledge that they were ineligible, would that constitute fraud? Well, certainly doesn't sound good, you know, for sure. You know, so I would say that they'd have some explaining to do. But again, I think that that would, you know, be in the hands of attorney a question to, you know, be best asked them. So... I have concerns that a suspected ineligible road association's lawyer and the town of Acton's lawyer work for the same firm. Both of these lawyers have been notified of the question of legitimacy of Tattle Street Road Association statutory status. This is clearly a conflict of interest. So I wouldn't be prepared to say whether or not it's a conflict of interest. I'm more interested in the related party. So clearly, if there's a relationship, but that's an easy answer to do. I'm, I'm not going to tell you whether or not it's. I'll tell you if it is. There's a problem, you know. But one way to go in and find it, go into main licensing. You know, just tr bring whoever the suspected people's up. Bring their licenses up. It'll tell you who they work for. Because for for somebody has to pick up their license. You know, same way with me. I'll tell you who the employer is. So just go in and see. You know, if there's a relationship with that. But I would certainly hope 
that like any other law firm that they do their due diligence and conflict of interest checks you know before you know they enter into a relationship but uh, that could be a clear problem obviously you know if the uh, the attorney is the same person working for both sides that's a problem and just for for your own knowledge uh, the, the town of Acton did ask um, if Tattle Street Road Association met their statutory status um, but it was not to that firm we used Joe Lankowski and I have uh, that in an email yeah but, so but it's not the one of, of possible yeah. conflict is what I'm saying yeah but if there is a conflict meaning somebody's representing both sides there, there's a problem in, in the, the other same. firm in Burke and Clegg in the other one that's what I mean yeah. Yeah. but easily you can just go online Secretary of State okay. it'll tell you who the person works for yeah. another possible conflict of interest is that the town of Acton's town administrator is on the board of selectmen in the town of Shapley. The road commissioner for the town of Shapley is contacted to maintain Tattle Street by the Tattle Street Road Association. Although the town administrator has no clear role in determining eligibility for Article 43, we do not know how much influence they have on the people that do. So that's you. That's me. We'll get right to your chair. So that's you. And, and, and just so I'm clear, you're a board member over in Shapley. Elected. Town elected. Town administrator over here. And there's a relationship with the town of Acton and the town of Shapley where you utilize Shapley's road commissioner. No, no. Tattle Street oh, is a private road. What it is is the road commissioner from Shapley. He's now the road commissioner. He wasn't for a little while, but now he's a road commissioner. But he does private work for, for the road. town of Shapley. He does. He, he's a road commissioner for the town of Shapley, but he also does private work on this road association. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, this Tattle Street is private, mm -hmm. private, even though it's an. Act. Tattle Street pays the elected road commissioner as an independent contractor. Yeah. To maintain well, Tattle this Street. This no. Yeah. So keep going. So, what this 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 individual's been doing this road work before our town administrator became slightly over there. Yep. So just to kind of bunch this together there, there's the accusations being made that she has some influence over us to give this money out to that road. Why would you have, well, well, I'm just trying to understand. I don't have any interest in Tattle Street, no it, offense but, guys. But. Oh no, but <laughs> the, the thing is, is like I was explaining, the person already was doing the work before she became the selectman. They were already yep. being hired to do that work. Um, and um, I like to make sure that everybody knows that uh, there isn't a whole lot of influence over me. <laughs> so, and even as a selectman in Shapley, I don't have any control over the elected road commissioner in Shapley. Uh, I guess I'm confused. So, so a couple of things. The road, the road commissioner is like a board of selectmen. That's a statutory position, you know, that's created. But you he's know? working as a private contract. Got, well, well, he sounds like he's got two hats. You know, one is he wears the road commissioner for Shapley, which you're on the board for. And right. the other one, he has a private business where he's trying to make a living, exactly. you know, from what I understand. But right. I'm still trying to get it into Tattle Street here, though. So what? Uh, so so apply, what? Happened? Because Tattle Street has applied for funds through Article 43. Yep. Okay. This individual is insinuating that because our town administrator is a selectman in Shapley and the town of Shapley's road commissioner has a private contract that works on that road. I'm not so uh, <laughs> I'm not, I need to know more, you know. But but if you ever get into the point in I Shapley, don't. recuse yourself, you know, of voting on the matter. Period. Well, no, we act and Shapley doesn't deal but, with that with that street to, at all. They're trying to get through you. That sounds like somebody's trying to influence and get to you because of your influence in Shapley as a board member and tie it to this road commissioner. Exactly. And what I'm saying is if they're trying to do that, just make sure if there's anything that comes up in Shapley as you're voting on it, recuse yourself if you think right. it's going to be And Shapley would never deal with Town yeah. Street. So, so a couple of things. You know, it's a, it sounds like there could be some relationships of what we call a related party. But just because there's a related party doesn't mean there's a conflict of interest. We can send you a two-page uh, program that basically tells you whether or not a related party, and I'm going through that check list in my mind right now I don't see it you know I, I don't see that you know and I would hope that if there's something that did get from the contractor to you and your position over there that you wouldn't put yourself just recuse yourself you know from voting that that immediately removes any conflict of interest so so the application process for article 43 is that they fill out the application and then it goes to the highway committee so, the road. so the road committee. They turn it into me, and then I distribute it to the selectmen and the road. But you're not approving it. You're not home. No, I'm got a it. paper pusher. So got she has nothing to do with any got approvals. It. Yeah, just, I, I'm having a hard time getting there. So, but but we can send you the conflict of interest from the related if you want to do the check marks. I'm having a hard time getting there. So, thank you.
That was turning. Okay. Thank you very much. So my question is, are we in, in pretty good shape here? I think financially, you guys are solid. Like I said, these conversations didn't roll this way years ago. You know, there were some struggles. You know, there were some, you know, some financial issues. There was a, there was a lot of housekeeping that we did. So, so going back to then and coming up to now, I think Acton's make great progress and, and, and having an above average grade financially for the town. You know, uh, I, I think that that's good news. You know, and I, I think that also, you know, what I would do, housekeeping, do your housekeeping, you know. And that's that's something that's a full time job, and you know, and when you when you have access to this money, and when you have got busy, Acton's a busy town, and got a lot going on. Just make sure that you make adjustments where necessary, and and uh, and I think that you've done a good job of that. So good. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank you guys. I know the the weather wasn't very nice on the way down here. We're on our way back to nice nice weather to Bangor. So we guys are heading back Bangor. tonight. No yep. Okay. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you much. Sure. And um, you guys also. So I guess we'll call the meeting. And I think before we go, yeah, all good. All good. Thank you. 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 Thank you.